about a local convergence theory for mildly overparameterized two-layer neural nets. So it's a pleasure to introduce Rong to have him speak. Um, actually, I've been working with Rong since for almost a decade, so since he was a second-year grad student. Uh, he's an expert in all things theoretical machine learning, so some of the stuff you might know him for are tensor methods and their applications to latent variable models, non-convex optimization, landscape analysis for things like matrix completion, and also a ton of the early works and most important stuff in the theory of deep learning. So we're very excited to have him speak. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the very nice introduction and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, yeah, so, so today I'm going to talk about this new result uh, about local convergence for our prime trice neural networks. Uh, so this is joint work with my student, Mo Zhou and uh, Chu Jin from Princeton. Uh, so Moi did most of the work and the paper is still not on archive and that's mostly my fault. Um, but hopefully we will put the paper on archive soon. Um, okay, so uh, of course deep learning is cool and we hear many things now and then and I'm sure more things will come. Uh, but uh, as we care about uh, theory, the question that I really wanted to understand is why does deep learning work, right? And, and that is a huge question. It, it has a lot of aspects. Um, at the very least, there are these three basic problems uh, about why does deep learning work. So there is the representation problem, uh, which talks about why there should be a, a good neural network that computes whatever function that you are trying to um, compute. And uh, there's also the question of optimization, which is suppose these kind of good neural networks exist, how can we find this good neural network? Uh, but even if we can find a good neural network that fits our data perfectly, there is still the problem of generalization, uh, which is why would this neural network work on test data, on data that it has not seen uh, on the training time? And um, we have, uh, been uh, like since a lot of research on deep learning, we all have known that uh, these all three of these problems are very tightly connected, uh, and it's actually hard to talk about generalization without optimization, and it's hard to um, isolate uh, any part of this. But um, in this talk, what I will try to do is we will focus on a particular aspect of optimization for uh, neural networks. And in particular, in order to abstract away uh, the other two uh, main problems of deep learning, uh, we are going to work in a teacher-student setting. Uh, so since our goal is to prove something about optimization, we are going to assume that there is already a good network, which we call the teacher network. And we are also going to assume that we have enough samples, like we have uh, basically infinitely many samples, uh, of course, this will be relaxed. We don't actually need infinitely many samples, but uh, it's good to think that we uh, work with uh, population loss and we have enough samples for uh, most of the things we want. Um, so there is this teacher network, uh, and uh, what we are going to try to do is to learn a student network. The teacher network is going to be used to generate the data. So we are going to sample the input from a certain distribution, and then we are going to compute the label y uh, according to this teacher network. And then after we have the data x and y, uh, we are going to define a loss for an objective uh, on the student network, uh, which in this talk will just be the simple squared loss, uh, which measures the squared distance, uh, or the expected squared distance between the output of the teacher network and the output of the student network. Uh, so in this setting, uh, a good solution would be that we uh, manage to learn a student network that mimics the behavior of the teacher network. Uh, and the objective function value will be zero. Uh, obviously, the, it is possible to achieve a zero loss just because there is already a very nice teacher network. So if the student network matches the teacher network in terms of parameters, then the loss would be zero. But uh, as we will see later in the over-parameterized neural networks, 
uh, that's not going to be the only uh, global optimal solution. Uh, so optimization for neural networks is difficult, uh, even when you only consider the simplest possible case where uh, it is a two-layer neural network. Um, so uh, some time ago, I had this naive hope, uh, which says for standard objectives for neural networks, maybe all local minima are also globally optimal. And if this were true, then uh, what it would suggest is you can just use very standard optimization algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent, and it will find a local minimum and therefore find the global optimal solution. Uh, however, this is not a very reasonable hope. There are uh, many different lower bounds for uh, optimizing uh, for uh, neural networks, even for two-layer neural networks. They say that uh, it would be impossible to uh, learn a neural network in this setting. Uh, and then, of course, uh, maybe we can try to get around these lower bounds by adding some assumptions, right? So it's the naive hope number two that I had was maybe for some very nice input distribution, or maybe if we assume there's some nice teacher network, then all local minima are still uh, globally optimal. But unfortunately, even that doesn't seem to be true. Um, people have demonstrated that uh, even very simple two-layer neural networks can have bad local minima, uh, especially when your student network has exactly the same architecture as the teacher network. And for a two-layer neural network, that just means uh, the number of neurons of your student network is exactly the same as the number of neurons uh, of the teacher network. Uh, and to make it uh, more complicated, finding a global minimum uh, is not always good enough for deep learning. Uh, and there recently there has been a lot of work on understanding the trajectory of training and understanding the implicit bias introduced by the training process. Uh, so because of these difficulties, um, there are a lot of new results that focus on optimization for over-parameterized neural networks. Uh, so it, it is now known that uh, if you have a very overparameterized neural network, uh, optimization can become easy. But there are also many different regimes for overparameterization. Uh, so one of the regime is called the neural tangent kernel regime. So in this setting, um, uh, uh, you start with a random initialization uh, with a very large number of neurons. And what uh, people were able to prove is that uh, under some scaling of initialization and some number of neurons, uh, you will be in this neural tangent kernel regime where neurons do not actually move much. They mostly stay where they started with. Uh, and uh, when the neural network is in this regime, optimization is easy to analyze. And uh, a lot of these results can prove that uh, eventually you get a zero training error. Uh, but there's also a very different regime, uh, which is called the mean field regime. Uh, so this, uh, this regime has a very different scaling uh, compared to the neural tangent kernel regime. And in general, uh, it, uh, the, one of the main difference is that in the mean field regime, neurons can potentially move uh, a lot farther away from their initial point. And uh, in this regime, also a very interesting phenomena when you look at a two-layer neural network uh, is uh, that in the teacher-student setting, student uh, neurons will eventually always match one of the teacher neurons. So as you can see uh, in this picture in the right, uh, on the right, um, so uh, student neurons uh, are the circles and um, their movement are uh, these black lines. Uh, as you can see, they eventually all uh, move to some place that is aligned with one of these blue lines, which, is, which represents a teacher neuron. Um, while in the neural tangent kernel regime, the student 
feature matching uh, does not uh, happen. Uh, uh, in a very interesting paper by uh, Chizad and Buck, uh, they showed that uh, these two regimes are actually very closely related uh, and it's really uh, dependent on the scale of the initialization. Um, and uh, they call the neural tangent kernel regime the lazy chaining regime where neurons don't really move much. And the mean field regime is just another extreme where uh, neurons can, uh, are allowed to move much farther away. Uh, and empirically, uh, because the student neur uh, neurons match teacher neurons in the mean field regime, uh, this regime is actually preferred uh, in the sense that uh, for these teacher-student setting, the generalization for the mean field regime is actually much better. Uh, the problem here is though, un unlike neural tangent kernel regime, where we have very concrete polynomial uh, bounds on um, the number of neurons required and the num amount of time that it takes for convergence. In the mean field regime, most of the results are asymptotic. What they say is uh, if the number of neurons goes to infinity and if the time goes to infinity, uh, eventually you will converge to a global optimal solution. Uh, there are some results with uh, convergence rates, but often those results would require number of neurons that are exponential in the dimension. Um, so uh, uh, the problem with uh, this approach is really it's hard to get a very concrete polynomial time, uh, polynomial bound on either the running time or uh, the number of neurons. And in particular, the number of neurons uh, often needs to be exponentially large. Uh, in fact, even a much a uh, simpler problem was not understood for the mean field regime, which is the problem of local convergence. So, uh, so this is the problem where you initialize the network uh, with a small initial loss. So if the initial loss is small, one would expect that you will eventually converge uh, to the global optimal solution. Uh, but even this was uh, unknown. So. Uh, would a two-layer neural network converge to a global optima efficiently? Uh, empirically, of course, this is indeed true. Um, uh, but uh, theoretically, uh, it is actually tricky to prove. Uh, I would point out that this is actually known when the, your network is exactly parameterized. By that, I mean uh, you have a two-layer network where the size of the student network is exactly the same as the size of the teacher network. Uh, in that case, uh, local convergence is known, uh, but the problem becomes much trickier when the network is over-parameterized. And uh, our work uh, gives a proof that uh, there is actually uh, local convergence for over-parameterized two-layer neural networks in a fairly strong sense. Uh, so what we prove, uh, roughly speaking, is given data generated by a two-layer teacher network with R neurons and separation delta. Uh, roughly speaking, separation is just the teacher neurons needs to have angle at least delta uh, with each other. And that is a fairly natural assumption. Uh, what we can show is that there exists a threshold uh, which is polynomial in these two parameters, in particular in delta over R, such that when the loss is smaller than epsilon zero, uh, gradient descent uh, always will converge to a global optimum. And also in this global optimum, all student neurons will match the direction of one of the teacher neurons. Uh, except of course, some of the student neurons might go to zero. Uh, and in that case, we also think that it matches one of the teacher neurons. Uh, so that's what we can prove. Uh, the result, uh, what is a bit surprising because as you can see, the threshold epsilon zero uh, here is actually independent of the size of the student network, as long as the student network size uh, is as large as the teacher network. Uh, it can be R, it can be R squared, it can even be go to infinity, but the threshold of this local convergence does not change. Uh, the threshold is also independent of the dimension of input data. Uh, and that could be useful 
when we are thinking of very high dimensional data. Um, we also give very uh, concrete convergence rates. Uh, so after you uh, start below the threshold, the convergence rate is going to be order one over t. Um, and here, what's a little bit surprising is in many of the previous work, uh, in many previous settings where people know local convergence, convergence rate is often uh, geometric. Uh, you would expect something that converges as e to the minus t. Uh, but in this setting, uh, it is actually necessary that the convergence rate is not e to the minus t is not geometric. Um, the convergence rate, the correct convergence rate should be some polynomial. Uh, also, we don't know whether one or t is tight or not. Uh, so some of the previous work on local convergence. First, uh, as I mentioned, uh, several papers uh, analyze the local convergence uh, for exact parameterization models when the number of student neurons is uh, the same as the number of teacher neurons. Uh, and of course, both of these work actually also give some ways of uh, have constructing a reasonable initialization under different assumptions. Uh, in the more parameterized models, uh, there are much fewer results, but one very uh, interesting result is by Chizat uh, in a paper called Sparse optimization on measures with overparameterized gradient descent. Um, so, uh, so in this paper, uh, he did prove uh, local convergence for overparameterized gradient descent in some settings. Uh, it does not apply to the neural network settings that we are going to talk about in this talk because uh, the convergence relies on assumptions uh, that are only known uh, for different models uh, that are not very related to a neural network, or well, that are similar, but, but not exactly neural networks. Uh, the threshold for convergence, uh, the initial value that you need to be smaller than, uh, depends on some quantities that are a bit hard to compute. And we certainly don't know whether those values are uh, exponentially small or polynomial in uh, relevant parameters for neural networks. Uh, and a third difference between this work and what I'm going to talk about is that uh, this work requires a sparsity-inducing regularizer. Uh, as the title suggests, it, it's going to give you a sparse result. So, so after you have the sparse-inducing regularizer, most of the student neurons are going to go to zero, and uh, you will have a very sparse solution. Uh, as we will later see, uh, if you have a regularizer, it actually significantly changes the local behavior of these models. Uh, Sorry, would you mind going back um, one slide? I, I just have a question about the informal theorem. Right. So, I mean, it seems pretty surprising that the student neurons match in direction of one of the teacher neurons, just given this threshold, you know, behavior. But once you're within that threshold, is it already true that necessarily, um, you know, the student network has the property that neurons match, like some of the neurons match the teacher network or? Uh, in, to some extent that is true. Uh, like one very crucial shows that in the proof, which I will uh, talk about briefly, is once you are below the threshold, uh, it is possible to show that for each teacher neuron, there is at least one student neuron that is close to this particular teacher. Uh, and but so, it's not true that it's not necessary that all student neurons are close to one of the teacher neurons. Right, because it's over-parameterized. But I guess as a follow-up question, uh, does I mean, that's a very useful property to have when analyzing the dynamics because, you know, once you're within that threshold, there is some measure of progress analytically that you're interested in. Um, does that break down beyond two layers? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we Yuri's don't... smiling, so he may have had the same question. Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, we don't know how to prove that uh, beyond two layers. But on the other hand, uh, there are some, like if you don't care about rates, if epsilon is equal to zero, there are some proofs that says mm -hmm. 
uh, that goes beyond two layers. Right, uh, but I made uh, this super interesting point in the beginning about, you know, the, um, I mean, the curse of dimensionality and some of the mean field style things. And I'm just trying to tease out whether like, you know, yeah, that exactly that behavior. <laughs> Yeah, so when epsilon is equal to zero, things, things are more well understood. We, we don't know how to extend this to multiple layers uh, when we need to care about these polynomial rings. Sorry, Ron, can I ask a much more dumb question? So, uh, what, so when you say loss is smaller, do you mean the loss in the ERM objective or loss as a distance to truth? Uh, loss as the population loss, the ERM object. So it's, Okay, so this means that these models are always identifiable. So in particular, this shouldn't apply to ReLU, uh, I suppose. Indeed, I, I'm going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, uh, the, uh, the network, I, I should have a start here. The network is not completely standard. Uh, and in particular, uh, it wouldn't apply to ReLU. It would apply to ReLU with some twist, but yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, yeah, as, as mentioned, uh, yeah, the setup is not completely standard for a two-layer neural network. So I'm going to first talk about the detailed setup. Uh, what are the activation functions we are using and, and what are uh, how are data generated? Uh, so the teacher network is going to be a two-layer fully connected network uh, and the teacher neurons we will denote by WI star. Uh, the assumptions on these teacher neurons uh, is that the angles between WI stars are at least delta. So that's the delta separation that we were talking about in the theorem. And for simplicity for this talk, we will assume WI stars are unit norm. Uh, also, like the result depends polynomially on the maximum and minimum norm on the, uh, for the teacher neurons. Uh, in this um, teacher network, the second layer weights are fixed to one. That is, the number one is not a particular problem because you can change the norm of WI star. But, but what, what this really means is we are restricting ourselves to networks that only have positive second layer weights. Uh, and, and that is uh, one thing that is necessary to uh, make sure all student neurons match uh, teacher neurons. And we also use- Sorry, so uh, identifiability presumably breaks down when you don't have this uh, no cancellation property, right? Yes, I, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you a, a picture very soon. So uh, the activation function is also the absolute value function instead of the radical function. Uh, I mean, these two functions are in some sense quite similar. If you have a radical network, what you can always do is you can first fit the best linear approximation to the network that fits the degree one term. And after removing the degree one term from ReLU, uh, basically you get the absolute value function. So uh, in some sense, this is not super different, but we need that uh, again, because of identifiability issues. Uh, uh, both assumptions are here to make sure that the student neurons can only match teacher neurons at, uh, at global optima. So here are examples where uh, if we don't assume these uh, things may break. So if your teacher neuron looks like this, um, get a pointer. So if your teacher neuron looks like this, uh, basically you have three neurons uh, that are uh, like two pi or three apart from each other. Uh, it is actually, uh, the, so the, and if you use random activation, it is actually equivalent uh, to uh, these three neurons. Um, and uh, it's not a very hard calculation to do and you can do it to try to convince yourself. Um, on the other hand, when you use absolute value activation, this is still true, like these two uh, networks are going to be the same, but because we are using absolute value, where, um, so the direction of W, uh, uh, whether it's pointing up or down is actually the same direction, right? Because uh, these two are just the opposite of each other. So we will basically identify these two directions. We'll identify uh, this direction with this one, and we will identify this direction with this one. 
and we will still say that the student neurons uh, match teacher neurons in this case. Uh, so that's why we need to use uh, an absolute value activation and we will measure angle uh, in terms of the smaller angle, that is the smallest angle you can get after considering uh, possible flippings of your direction. Um, and uh, another assumption is that the uh, second layer weights are positive. Uh, this is easy to see if second layer weights are allowed to be negative, then in an overparameterized model, you can have uh, this red neuron and this yellow neuron uh, uh, and uh, for an absolute value activation, they can just cancel each other. Um, uh, if one of them have second layer weight plus one and the other have second layer weights minus one. Um, uh, so in order to avoid these issues of non-identifiability, we are assuming that uh, second layer weights are positive and that the activation function is absolute value instead of random. Uh, so any more questions about uh, the assumptions on teacher network? Okay, yeah. So then uh, given the teacher network, uh, data is generated as you might expect, uh, X is sampled from a Gaussian and Y is computed uh, according to the teacher network. And the student network uh, has a very similar parameterization, except it is a little bit funny. Um, so here, uh, for a student network, uh, for neuron i, uh, the uh, weight vector is going to be wi, but the second layer weight, the coefficient in front of this neuron, is going to be the norm of wi. Uh, so basically, there is a coupling between the first layer weight and the second layer weight in the sense that they have the same norm. Uh, we are not the first one who uses this uh, prom transition. This is uh, at least done in the previous paper uh, in this year's code by uh, 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 Yuan Zhi, Tang Yu, and Hong Yang. Uh, so the main reason of doing this coupling between first and second layer weights is to ensure some sort of smoothness for the uh, uh, objective function. Basically, if I fix the second layer weight to be one, instead of fix, uh, fixing it to the norm of wi, uh, the loss function is not going to be smooth when wi is equal to zero. Uh, and that would introduce some additional problems for the optimization. Uh, the loss function is just very standard. You look at the squared loss, which is the difference uh, between uh, the student network uh, output and the teacher network output. Uh, I didn't have a subscript here, but all the expectations on the slides are with respect to the data x, y. Uh, and of course, since we don't have y here, like it's really an expectation with respect to x being drawn from a Gaussian. Um, so um, given these uh, uh, set up uh, some more detailed results. What we can prove is assume teacher neurons are delta separated, then there exists the threshold that we were talking about, such that if the loss is smaller, then the norm of the gradient squared is at least one over r. Remember, r is the number of teacher neurons times the loss of uh, times the loss function squared. And uh, if you have seen these uh, local convergence or optimization results before. This actually looks very similar to the PL condition. Uh, so the PL condition is a condition where a very similar inequality holds, except you don't have the square, right? So the norm of the gradient squared should be greater or equal to some number times the loss. Uh, so that's known as the PL condition. Uh, but in this case, we prove a slightly weaker version where you need to have a power uh, on top of the loss. And this difference is actually necessary. The original PL condition is not true in our setting. Uh, on the other hand, whether this power two is tight or not, I'm not 100% uh, sure. I, I actually suspect it might not be tight. Um, so another, uh, to, uh, uh, another result that goes very well with the uh, PL-like condition is we can also show some version of smoothness 
so what I wrote here is basically very similar to smoothness except for this rev term, which is the norm of u to the 1.5, uh, which you don't typically have in a very standard smoothness. Smoothness usually uh, wants to bound this uh, difference by the norm of u squared. Uh, but we have this additional u to the 1.5 term and it really doesn't matter too much uh, in, in our case. Uh, uh, basically, when you choose u to be the gradient direction, you can uh, eventually you can uh, get rid of this term and it works as well as smoothness for us. Uh, because the PL condition is a bit weaker, that's why we get a polynomial convergence in, instead of a geometric convergence. And as I mentioned, that is necessary. Um, so uh, before I tell you some of the ideas for the proofs, I'd like to first talk about uh, why is um, local convergence for over prime price models interesting? Why uh, is that actually very different from local convergence for exact prime price models? Uh, so in some sense, local convergence for exact prime price model should not be something that you are surprised about. Uh, I, I would even go on to say that every reasonable model or every identifiable model uh, should have some kind of local convergence when you are exactly parametrized. What do I mean by that? Uh, often the set of global optima for exact parametrized model are isolated and they are equivalent up to permutation. And because they are equivalent up to permutation, let's just look at the local optima that is exactly equal to W star, which is the uh, weight of the teacher network. Well, in this case, we can compute the Hessian uh, of the loss function at this W star. And we can locally approximate this function using a quadratic uh, expansion, right? At the optimal, the zero order term is zero the first order term, the gradient term is zero. So the loss is approximately this quadratic term. Uh, here, of course, I'm abusing notation a little bit, uh, but what's important here is the loss is approximately this quadratic form. Uh, so as long as you can show that the Hessian at uh, W star is uh, strictly positive definite, then the loss is locally strongly convex and if the loss is locally strongly convex, uh, it is well known that for a strongly convex function, locally you will have uh, geometric convergence. And that is why, uh, and, and when you are exactly parametrized, often this Hessian is going to be positive definite. It is unclear what is going to be the smallest eigenvalue and it's unclear uh, how, you know, how wide of a branch this would hold. Uh, but if you don't care about those things, local convergence should not be something that's uh, very surprising for exact parameterized models. Uh, so what goes wrong when you are having a over parameterized model? Uh, so, so the first problem is that the global minima are no longer isolated. Uh, so uh, the example is just this very simple example where you will have one teacher neuron, the Wu neuron, and you have two student neurons that both match the direction of teacher neuron and uh, have a smaller weight, right? Uh, when you sum them up, they add up to the teacher neuron. But of course, you can adjust the weight uh, of these two student neurons so that they still add up to the teacher neuron. Uh, so in, in this way, you can construct a path uh, of global minimum. Um, because you have such a pass, the Hessian cannot be positive definite in this particular direction. Uh, the Hessian must be zero in this particular direction. So the naive the previous argument would not work. On the other hand, this is not a huge problem because even if I have a low dimensional manifold of global minima, if when I go away from this global uh, this manifold of global minimum, uh, I, my loss function still increases quadratically. And in some sense, the Hessian is still positive definite. After I remove these directions, then I'm still going to be fine, right? Uh, then a, a very similar argument is going to apply 
Uh, however, that's not going to be what's happening in this overcrowded trans neural network model. Uh, so uh, the problem number two is that the loss might be of a lower order. And here, uh, I'm going to show you a very simple example. Uh, since we are using absolute value as activations, let's consider a teacher neuron that's just absolute value of x. So here, x is just one dimensional, just for simplicity. So the teacher says x uh, is just the absolute value of x. And we approximate it by the sum of two student neurons. One of them is half of x plus delta, absolute value. And the other is half of x minus delta, absolute value. These two functions look like the green lines. Then you take the sum of these two green lines, they look like this, okay? So basically, they match the teacher neuron exactly uh, when your x is outside of delta branch. And, um, and they are going to be flat when x is between minus delta and plus delta. So the difference between the student neurons and the teacher neuron is basically this triangle, which has one of the edge has lens two delta and the height is going to be delta, right? Uh, and what is the loss function here? Uh, I claim that the loss function is going to be theta of delta cubed. Uh, the reason is that the loss function is the integral of the height squared. So it is important that it is the integral of the height squared. It is not the area of this triangle. The area of the triangle is delta squared, right? But if you integrate over the height squared, over this triangle, you are going to get delta cubed because the height is delta and the length you are integrating is also of theta delta. Uh, so the loss function, uh, the loss you have here is theta of delta cubed. And that is very surprising because in terms of parameters, uh, these two student neurons are within distance delta to the teacher neuron. Uh, so uh, the loss is actually delta cubed instead of delta squared, and that is a lower order term. Uh, and that suggests that we cannot use uh, just simple Hessian information to understand this particular case. Uh, so uh, in the remaining time, I'm going to try to uh, sketch some of the proof ideas. Uh, it, uh, it's a pretty long proof, but um, so some of the parts you will have to believe me on some of the calculations. Uh, so as Hunker pointed out, uh, we choose this small loss threshold uh, because we are able to prove uh, that you can think that there are two notions of local, right? You can, one notion of local is that your loss function is small. Uh, the other notion of local is that um, you have one student neuron close to every teacher neuron. So we first show that these two notions can be converted. In particular, if your loss is small, then you will always have a student neuron that is close to each teacher neuron. Uh, not going to be able to say the, how to prove this, but rough intuition is that teacher neuron will introduce a nonlinearity uh, near some particular directions. Uh, Sorry, here, here I had a typo. Uh, teacher neuron will introduce a nonlinearity for x that's almost orthogonal to wi star, right? If there are no student neuron nearby wi star, then there will be no way to cancel out this nonlinearity. So rough takeaway is uh, because of this observation, we can group student neurons into R groups, one for each teacher, uh, and none of the groups will be empty. Uh, there will always be at least one student neuron that is very close to one teacher neuron. And next we are going to decompose the residual, which is the difference between the student network and the teacher network. We're going to decompose the residual into two terms, R1 and R2. And I'm going to explain what are these terms. So R1 uh, looks like this. Uh, as you can see, R1 in some sense is the distance of an average neuron to a teacher neuron wi star. Here I've only written R1 with respect to one group. Uh, so this is the group with respect to the teacher neuron i star. Uh, so uh, in this bracket, we have the distance of an average student neuron to the teacher neuron. And uh, we always use the activation uh, of the teacher neuron. R2, on the other hand, captures the difference in activation 
the fact that R is equal to R1 plus R2 is immediate just because things cancel out. Uh, but um, uh, we find it very useful to decompose the residual in this way. Uh, just uh, a, a very similar decomposition was actually used in Shizat's paper where he called R1 the, um, uh, the bias term and R2 the variance term. Uh, and here uh, we call R1 the flat term and R2 the spiky term. So basically R1 would look like this gray area where no matter what your X is, uh, its norm is roughly the same and it's uh, roughly proportional to the distance of average neuron. On the other hand, R2 is a very spiky residual, which is only large when you get close to one of the teacher neurons. And another very useful property for R2 is that it is actually always positive. Uh, let's recall that this very simple case of over prime transition that we talked about. Uh, in this case, the two student neurons are at symmetric positions uh, of the teacher neuron. And therefore, uh, their average is actually exactly equal to the teacher neuron. So in this case, the R1 term, the distance of the average neuron is going to be zero and the R1 term is going to be zero. And this uh, only has the spike, spiky term and the spiky term has the shape of this triangle. Uh, and that's, the spiky term is really why uh, things are very different in our setting. Uh, so for the flat term R1, as I mentioned, it captures the error of an average student neuron. So basically we partition the student neurons into R groups and for each group, we take the average and we compare the average to the corresponding teacher neuron. If the average is very close, then R1 is going to be small. Uh, it, it is flat in the sense that it has similar magnitude for most of the X. And because we are just partitioning things into groups and we are taking the average within each group, uh, R1 term is actually very analog, uh, very similar to the exact primary transition case. Um, and the uh, expectation of R1 squared is proportional to the distance of the average neuron to uh, the teacher neuron. For R2, st the story is actually very different. It captures the arrow of different activation and it will, will mostly concentrate around the teacher neurons. Uh, and R2 is really the difficult term that can be of lower order. R1 is always on the order of squared, uh, like delta squared, when delta is your difference. R2, on the other hand, can be of lower order. So we really need new ideas to understand the spiky terms. And to do that, we actually define a direction of improvement. Uh, we construct a direction where if you move in those directions, the loss will decrease. The construction is fairly natural for neurons that are very close to one of the teacher neurons we ask them to move to the teacher neuron. For neurons that are far away from every teacher neuron, we just ask them to move to zero. So the direction itself is not very surprising. Uh, but where, what's a bit surprising is we can, after some calculation, we can prove if the average neuron is close to the teacher neuron, then the direction we constructed will improve the loss. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the decrease is pro proportional to the loss minus uh, some quantity here, this alpha is the distance of the average neuron and delta max was the distance um, of student neuron to teacher neuron that we were talking about. We can also bound the distance of an uh, average neuron to teacher neuron by the, no the norm of the spiky term. Uh, so uh, um, I don't have time to explain the intuition that goes inside these two claims, but uh, what's important here is uh, uh, because of these claims, as long as we can bound the norm of the expected norm squared of the spiky term, uh, the direction of improvement that we constructed uh, will indeed be a direction of improvement, will reduce the loss. So how can we bound the spiky terms? Well, if we let delta j to be the distance of the j student neuron to its closest teacher neuron, when both of them are normalized. So this delta is really a direct uh, a distance in the directions, not a distance that's, uh, that's related to the norms. Uh, 
after some calculation, you can bound the spiky term by, by the summation uh, of norm of wj squared uh, delta j to the three uh, halves uh, and the whole thing squared. Um, and uh, one of the crucial step in our proof is to bound what's inside this bracket. Uh, in fact, we bound something that's slightly different. We bound uh, some, okay, sorry, the square should be outside of the norm. Uh, wj is a vector and wj squared doesn't make sense, but it's uh, the norm of wj squared. Um, so um, what we are able to prove is some summation of norm of wj squared times delta j squared is going to be order uh, square root epsilon. Uh, and even though the powers on delta are slightly different, uh, that can be easily fixed by applying some cauchy schwartz or uh, Holder's inequality. Uh, overall, this claim is trying to say that large neurons uh, should not be far from teacher. You can be far away from the teacher if your norm of wj squared is small, or if your norm of wj squared is large, uh, you shouldn't be far away from teacher. Uh, that's what this claim roughly says. And um, uh, so the question is really, how can we prove something like that? Uh, our idea is we will actually construct a test function. Uh, so this idea is very similar to the idea used in uh, maximum mean discrepancy uh, type of bounds for distances. So we will construct a test function uh, that has some very nice properties. So first, uh, the correlation of this test function with any teacher neuron is going to be zero. And second, the correlation of this test function with any student neuron is going to be proportional to the norm of wj squared delta j squared, which was the quantity that we were trying to bump on the left hand side. And finally, uh, of course, we uh, require a norm uh, for this particular test function. Um, if we can construct such a test function, uh, then it's very, if such a test function exists, then what we, uh, then the claim is very easy to prove because if we can just take the correlation of h of x with the residual, we would know first all the teacher neurons disappear, so we only have the student neuron term, and the student neurons have a correlation which is proportional to a norm of wj squared delta j squared. Sorry again that the square should be all the same. Um, and we, this correlation h of hx and r of x by Cauchy-Schwarz should be less or equal to the norm of h squared and r squared. The so norm of h squared by assumption is one. The norm of r squared, or the norm of r, or the expectation of r squared by definition is really just the loss. Uh, since the loss is epsilon, uh, this right-hand side is square root epsilon. Um, so that's why uh, if we can construct such a test function, uh, we would be done. Uh, and the test function, uh, so here it seems to be related to the norm of the student neuron, but it's really not related to that because uh, in property number two, both left-hand side and right-hand side are um, too homogeneous with respect to the norm of WJ. So you can really cancel that out and really only talk about what happens for a student neuron that has unit norm. Uh, so how can we construct such a test function? Well, first, before constructing such a test function, let's take a look at what such a test function would look like, right? Here in this plot, uh, I, well, this is not a real plot, of course. In this plot, think of the x-axis as the set of different w's. Uh, in reality, of course, the weight vectors are higher, high dimensional and cannot be plotted on a line, but for now, just think of of this line as all the possible w. And we have three teacher neurons, w1 star, w2 star, w3 star. Uh, so the test function uh, and the y-axis is going to be the correlation of this test function with w transpose x, with the neuron that has the weight w. Uh, according to the construction, or according to these conditions, we want this function or this correlation to be exactly zero at these three teacher neurons. And we want it to increase fairly smoothly, like in a quadratic sense, um, when you move away from the teacher neurons. So it should look something like that. So how can we construct a function that looks like that? 
uh, it's actually, um, we can do it in a few steps. So first for a single neuron, we'll construct a function that is only correlated with this teacher neuron, or that's only correlated with this teacher neuron and everything that's kind of close to it. Uh, and we hope that this will decay fast enough so that when I am at the position of a different teacher neuron, this is already almost zero. Uh, there are many different ways to do this, but for example, you can actually construct this using a Hermite polynomial. Uh, so once we construct such a bump uh, for one teacher neuron, we can take the sum of these bumps uh, for each teacher neuron. Uh, and because of the properties that I mentioned, uh, this is going to be a function that is very large at teacher neurons. And that's um, going to be become small very quickly when you go away from teacher neurons. Now, of course, what we wanted is kind of the opposite. We wanted a function that is very small, in fact, equal to zero at the teacher neurons and grows slowly uh, uh, when you are moving away from the teacher neurons. But that is actually a simple step. Uh, we can just use a constant function to subtract the, the sum of these, uh, these functions. Basically, you can look at the function in a different perspective, right? And if you change the axis to here, uh, that will be the function that we were looking for. Uh, there are some subtleties because, of course, uh, even though uh, these functions are small at these positions, they are not exactly zero and you will have some additional uh, terms to deal with. Uh, but roughly speaking, this will uh, work out. Uh, so that's roughly how we bound the norm of the spiky terms. And once you bound the total um, norm of the spiky terms, uh, uh, based on a lot of calculation, you can use that uh, to show that there is a uh, direction of uh, improvement. Okay, so just uh, to conclude, uh, we showed that for a two-layer or prime trans neural network, well, with some particular uh, uh, activation and assumptions on the second layer weights, once the loss is low, gradient descent will converge to a global optimal solution. Uh, we can extend this to if you are using stochastic gradient, and that's not very difficult. That's very standard. Um, what What's surprising to me for for this project is before starting this, I didn't expect that local convergence for or parameterized models to be very different. But as I mentioned, um, local convergence for or parameterized models uh, are actually very very different from local convergence of exact prime transition models and uh, it's something that uh, has not been well studied before. Uh, there are of course many open problems. Uh, one is uh, what happens if you are allowed to use other activations? What if you allow negative second layer weights? And uh, in addition to other activations, it's also reasonable to ask what happens if you move away from uh, neural networks, for example, what if you want to learn a mixture of Gaussians, but using an over prime trans model, does it uh, have any local convergence guarantees? Uh, um, and obviously we want to uh, extend this to multiple layers. As I mentioned, it is possible, uh, like there are results for multiple layers uh, if you don't care about grids, uh, but it's much harder to extend the polynomial dependency to multiple layers. And uh, finally, of course, uh, this is only a local convergence result. Uh, and it's still interesting to think about in what scenarios we can actually get the loss to be smaller than the initial threshold. Uh, thanks. Uh, any questions? Thanks very much.